Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. And I uh, will start to uh, report to you the first experience we had with the uh, red technology from Penumbra. Uh, we were pleased to start this experience a few months ago, and it is a summary of the of this first experience I have to to share with you today. So, what do we expect today for mechanical thrombectomy in 2023? We expect to be fast, of course, because we don't want to have a divorce. We want to come back home very quickly. Efficient, we want a ticky tree immediately. And we want to have something that is reproducible. That some things, that someone uh, or some people from different team can reproduce different night, different night with the same level of success. So reproducibility of a technique is the synonym of quality. And now has become uh, uh, essential since uh, we are opening sites everywhere. Uh, for uh, to deliver the thrombectomy service in a large number of places. So the reproducibility is also a very important point uh, because of the stroke, stroke service enlargement. So when you hear about that, it looks like aspiration is the solution. But if you look, and it's my understanding that I can share also with my colleague, but uh, that the frontline strategy has not been the aspiration for uh, from the beginning and for the last years. And there was some trend that I tried to summarize in my head, at least it is my perception of the frontline aspiration strategy. Uh, of course, we started with the separator and the very uh, 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 small lumen aspiration catheter in the early uh, 2000 years, 2006, 2009. And we had now the rise of the stent river technology. And in parallel to that, we had the randomized control trial compass that was not strongly positive. It was not positive at the moment of the, well, the compass was uh, evaluating the aspiration versus the medical therapy. It was not positive, but Mr. Clean and the State River, comp uh, the State River uh, trial, they were strongly positive. So I think it made very strong influence for people to use State River as a first line. In parallel to that, the aspiration was doing his life and people were using aspiration also as frontline. And then we got the Aster 1, Aster 2 trial, trying to see that, trying to show that there was a kind of superiority of the maximalist approach, but they, they failed really to demonstrate the maximalist approach at the, at the, at the direct frontline maximalist approach at the, at, the, at the strong, I mean, superiority on the first aspiration option. So this uh, being done, there was also, I mean, the change in terms of catheter generation with the, uh, with the, uh, the beginning of uh, the Sophia catheter that was extremely trackable into the anatomy and helped also to, to start this rise in terms of aspiration. In parallel to that, we had to open centers. We have spread uh, uh, the thrombectomy service to many, many sites where aspiration was, I mean, much more easier to teach than the combined and the, uh, than the combined approach. In parallel to that, we had also the second generation catheter with much more increased trackability. That's the, the family of the red. The increase of the size of the lumen of the aspiration catheter and also the new paradigm of aspiration now coming uh, in the field. So we are also expecting new trials to see if the aspiration first line may become a standard of care and have uh, some superiority over the stand that I'm sure that we will see in the next coming years. This is all the family of Penumbra that I've put there, but you see that up to 2006, we were just, 2016, sorry, we just had the ACE family. And in my end, at least, the level of trackability was a little bit behind, despite you had a very strong force of aspiration. And we saw the jump with JET and now with RED. And I, I have to say that for me, uh, uh, RED is a, I mean, is a breaking through technology compared to what it was before in terms of trackability with this catheter. I show you just the first case we did in last November. It was a male, 82 years old, coming from an hemiplegia. You had a direct one geo evaluation by CT scan. You tell me what you see, but we conclude that there was no hematoma. And we decided to keep on doing, Raoul. And so, uh, we went into the patient, it was a stroke. So we had uh, the first run at, uh, eight, at 6 at 23, and we start by uh, just um, a snaking with uh, the red 68, with the penumbra engine, and we had first a clot, but there was still something distal in the MCA, 
So what is the next step? So as we decide with colleagues, when you have productive passes, you do not switch your technique. You just keep on doing because you are just a productive passes. So we went to another aspiration. And actually, we had a full tiki tree. Uh, very a few minutes after coming into the patient, despite these two attempts, no microcatheter, no guide wire, just the wire you are using to get the carotid was used into the red to get this result. So very cheap, very reproducible. This technique could have been done, I think, by anybody after one week of neurointerventional uh, training. You can do this patient the same way, the same night with two different people. The reproducibility of this technique was extremely high. Uh, to solve this case. So between the entrance and the reperfusion, 55 minutes inside the golden hour with a very low procedure complexity and a very high level of reproducibility. For me, that's the conclusion of this experience. So the question is why aspiration may work at the end. You need forced transmission. You need to have something that is quite rigid to not collapse your material and to ensure a direct transmission of the aspiration forces to the clot. That's why you need to preserve the lumen integrity, and it may induce a little bit of stiffness. And in my understanding, that was a little bit the drawback of this perfect aspiration catheter that were built, is that because they wanted to preserve at all costs the lumen and the force of aspiration, they were compromising a little bit to the trackability. In the other hand, the Sophia was, in my view, much more trackable, with, but the, the preservation of the lumen was a little bit uh, uh, less, um, uh, less good than, uh, than what we had on the, on the pedomar catheter. So stiffness. So it's an example of the Paolo Maki uh, paper. That's a very good paper showing you how can be stressed a catheter when you apply strong aspiration forces if you are not really armed, uh, if you don't, if you don't have, if you're not, if you're not stiff enough and if you don't have any metallic support inside, you can be hurt and you can decrease the lumen of aspiration. So why these red catheter are now tracking so fast in the patient? And I asked them to give me the, the answer. They told me we cannot disclose. I say, but what, what, what will I say during the symposium? And you tell me we cannot say exactly what it is, but it's a specific coating that is uh, spread all over the last 30 centimeters of the catheter. And when you push the catheter, despite is really I mean, uh, the, the lumen is preserved. You can push him very hard in the patient, and the, pay, the, the we will see in a minute, there is almost no friction forces against the wall. If you compare the preview generation with ACE 68 and RED 68, there is 44% less friction forces on the vessel walls. Um, there's also one thing that is very important is in new generation, the tip is very atraumatic and allows you to push hard. This is my drawing and my understanding of what's happened when we want to cro cross the ophthalmic. You are in front of the ophthalmic, you're engaging the ophthalmic, but because you are pushing, you see in the middle, you have my arrow, you are deforming the anatomy and you are, you are pushing the convexity of the, of the carotid by pushing, but doing that, you are making a tilt at the distal part of uh, the catheter. And at one time you have the jump because, because he's tilting, he's losing the gap of the ophthalmic. Because now we can advance, you have the anatomic restitution, and then it's jumping, okay? Uh, you can do that only if you have an atraumatic tip, and that's the beauty for me of the red, is that they really worked on the atraumatic um, shape of the tip, doing specific features on it, but you can really push and you will not dissect or arm any vessel. I have here just a, a, a video showing a, a normal procedure with red, so they adjust the red, and just the O38 wire, there is no microcatheter, there is no micro wire, there is just the ground puncture, the access. And you see that here with the end, you have the O38 wire that is inside the red. We are just increasing the pressure. Increasing the pressure, you see now the, you have a pressure coming on the red catheter here. You see our drop putting a little bit forward the access catheter. And you see there is this uh, anatomic modification because, and you can also move a little bit the O38 wire inside the anatomy to help the jump, and you're just still pushing the catheter and it's just coming in the MCA in prison, very low technicity. I mean, it's extremely easy to make, no problem. So the 13 last case I had in my department, department I tried to retrieve the data. So we did aspiration first line in 55% of the case with 84% of TQ3, uh, TQ2C, 2C. So 45% 
of uh, the strategy were combined. We had some long cases, but you see it was a tandem, ICAD and three occlusion in the same patient, and another ICAD that explained a little bit the length of uh, the time to grow into final TK, but you see that we had some procedure with 10 minutes, 12 minutes, very often just using the red and uh, a wire, an access wire. And of course, I give you this, uh, uh, this example where the red was able to remove the calcified clot using a mini Fogarty technique and a scepter, mini scepter XC. I put this after the, the clot. You see the mini scepter XC here that is here just to block a little bit the clot. And we use this like a, a mini Fogarty. So you have the calcified clot and you see the red that is engaging by aspiration and being very strong against the calcified clot. I will show you the, so we'll push now uh, the, the, the calcified clot that is engaged into the distal part of the red. I asked my colleague to, to flush a little bit and you see this little piece of calcium that as you know, is extremely hard to remove in most of the thrombectomy. It's a reason for failed thrombectomy the most of, with ICA that is very frequent. And here we can, we, it was, I was able to remove it in, oui. in one pass using this mini Fogarty technique that I will explain a little bit more in, uh, in other meetings. So uh, just to illustrate, so not only the catheter is changing today, and that for me, that's the beauty of aspiration, um, is that there is an intelligence coming into the way of aspirating the clot. We used to just use syringe or just to use a pump on off, but now the aspiration is becoming clever, okay? For example, this new innovation, the lightning, when you are not in contact with the clot, they do not provide aspiration. They do not collapse vessels. And one big mistake of aspiration for the beginner is to try to start the aspiration before having clot contact. Then you have a vessel collapse and Emric that was here before has a very nice presentation on that. So you can, prevent people from making this mistake with this innovation because you just have to need to have clot contact and then you have green light and then you have aspiration unless you cannot collapse the vessel. So it's making probably the technique even more reproducible, even more easier. And you can spread the technique all over the centers that are opening. So aspiration 3.0 is at the point probably to come back in the field at the, uh, as the standard of care, even for the old first line stent user, uh, as I'm part of, because the tracking to the clot is extremely easy, because the contact aspiration is, I mean, understood by the device itself, and the way of delivering the force with new algorithm will also uh, increase a lot the, our capability to open vessels. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Vansan. Very interesting topic, uh, talking about the techniques, and, and thanks also for the perspective on the mechanical thrombectomy. So you said you, you were a first-line stent retriever, and now you were switching to aspiration? Yes, uh, I try to not stay only on my same first ID forever, and we need to evaluate, and I always try to test different technology. I do not have the very large bore catheter that are now coming, I will have, enter a study to have it, so I will test as well. But I see there is clear progress into the aspiration first line. It used to be, I, I tried aspiration when there was the first uh, uh, trial on aspiration, you know, but I was disappointed, okay? I had migration of emboli, I had incomplete reopening, so I, I was thinking that it's best maybe to use the maximum, the maximum of tool in, uh, to, to ensure the best result at the first pass. But since the aspiration did improve very much, the stain fever technology did not move that much from the last 10 years. It's always a lateral printing. Maybe we have the Nimbus coming with the pinching technique or some other, but the technology is basically the same. You do a lateral printing, you create friction forces between stent and thrombus, and you pray for these friction forces being strong enough to, 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 to put the clot out. And aspiration now is the one that is making the innovation. They are changing the side, the trackability, they are changing the engine that is producing the force to the clot. So for me, they are the one that moving at the moment uh, further, the, fast, the, fate, the, the, fast, the fastest. Yeah, very, very interesting per perspective, having dedicated catheters and the oscillatory aspiration, mm. I think is, is something very innovative. Are there any questions from the audience? So, 
uh, Ricardo, you have the large bore catheters uh, available. So uh, they, do you have the same perspective of migrating towards aspiration with that technology? Uh, and, uh, great talk, Vincent. Great to see you. Uh, uh, we, uh, we never get a shiny star from our buying department because we're always asking for a, a better and more expensive tools. Uh, uh, two, three years ago, we, we used to be a primary scent retriever uh, and with this better and improved, just like you point out, uh, we got a shiny star because we were saving money. I think that's another point that uh, on the, all the things that you list, I think if you can do a good quality aspiration, it, it decreases the cost. Uh, we are enrolling on the Route 92 trial, on the imperative trial, and there are many more to come. Uh, it's pretty impressive what we can accomplish uh, when you're putting an 88 uh, catheter on the distal carotid or an M1. So I, I think that's, uh, we've we got to show data on that, right? So I think it would be very interesting when you have that. But the performance, there's no question, uh, like, like you point out, innovation is there and is improving performance, is making this faster mm -hmm. and better for us to help our patients. So thank you very much, uh, Vincent.